An incredible story, but it's a story that you've probably heard before. It's a story that has been handed down through oral tradition. It's interesting to hear Noah begin in this movie, Noah, begin this story by saying, I want to tell you a story that my father told me, and then I've told you, and you will tell your children. It's a story about how we came to be and how everything around us came to be. But it's not just a story. It's a big story. And it was handed down orally until Moses decides to put it into writing. And then we have written this story, this tradition that had been handed down verbally for many, many, many years. It's a story about who we are. It's a story about what we will become. But it's not necessarily the story that many people today think that it is. I love this story because this story is truly, truly epic. You know, in our culture, we wrestle with this story because uh, we, we wrestle within the culture, not just because this story is supernatural, but because this story big. You know, epic is a word that we use quite frequently nowadays. You know, you'll hear uh, young adults say, man, that, that was totally epic. And, and they'll be describing something that really is not epic whatsoever. And people went to see this movie, Noah. I thought it was a horrible movie, but they came out saying, man, that was an epic movie. But actually the word epic is not something that came from uh, movies. It's something that is a literary term. The definition of epic, quite simply, is, is this. It is a long composition, usually centered upon a hero, in which a series of great achievements or events is narrated in elevated style. Now, to put that very simply, epic means this. It's a story about a huge hero, a larger-than-life hero who does larger-than-life things, but it's told in a larger-than-life fashion. And I can tell you that the Genesis account of creation is indeed epic. It's a larger-than-life hero God doing larger-than-life things, creating everything that we know, and it tells it in such a fashion that it is larger-than-life in just the telling. Modern culture's dilemma is that they want, to, they want to try and square this Genesis account of creation with science. And what happens when we try to do that many times is for Christians, we have this conflict of faith. We have these scientific facts that go uh, behind this, this creation story that we've been taught our entire life. And for people who aren't Christians who are wrestling with the whole Genesis creation story versus the science, they feel like in order to be people of faith, they would have to totally deny science. And, and neither one of these things are necessary. Uh, the reality is that this story was intended not to be shared in the context of science. That this story is intended to be shared in the context of the cosmology of ancient Israel. You know, it's interesting that uh, so many times when we look at biblical stories, uh, we get mixed up and we tell them as if they're a bedtime story or they're an imaginary story. Uh, years ago, a 17th century um, Shakespearean actor was asked by the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, why are you so able to be convincing with your audience with an imaginary tale when we preachers tell real things and we can't seem to reach our audience? And the man's name, the actor's name was Thomas Betterton, and this is what he said. He said, actors speak of things imaginary as if they were real, while you preachers often speak of things real as if they were imaginary. And you know, sometimes we get caught up in that, and what happens when we start talking of things that are real, like this creation story, as if they were imaginary, we lose the awe and wonder that we should feel within that story. You see, this story was intended to be spoken to a group of people in ancient Israel to tell them not just how things came into being, but who made things come into being. It was told in the context of ancient cosmology, which is their understanding of, of the world and things around. Remember the people that heard this story first, heard this story within the context of the world is flat, the moon is a light all on its own. They didn't realize it was a reflection of the sun. All the things around them were very, very simple. And so this story was told in a way that they in themselves could understand. 
And so we have to understand this. Before we really dive into the wonder of this story, we have to understand that this text has a context. And I was taught in graduate school, text without context is pretext. And what that means is if you look at the text and you don't understand the context within which it's being written, what happens is you create pretext, meaning you can make a lot of assumptions about this text that were never intended to be made. And, and so this morning, we want to look at the context that we're, we're dealing with here. And the context was, it was to be handed down so that ancient Israel could understand who created them. It's also very dangerous when we look at Scripture in God's unchanging revelation. It's very danger to, dangerous to compare or contrast God's unchanging revelation to any particular scientific uh, thought. And, and the reason for that is science is always in flux. God's revelation is unchanging. If you don't believe science is always in flux, I'll ask you a question. I'll ask these, these guys know this answer. Who was the father of our country? Anybody? I can't believe what you're not learning in school. George Washington. Can anybody tell me how he died? He bled to death. Did y'all know that? George Washington died because he was bled to death because science at the time said if you were sick, the problem was is that you had too much blood and it was bad. So if they could draw the blood from you, it would recreate new blood and it would be good and fresh. And so George Washington was covered in leeches and bled to death. That was the science of the day. Hadn't changed, or has it? Sure. They've learned more, and we continue to learn more. And there are things within this story that we're going to read that, that we today look at and say, well, God was revealing some things that we need to know. A physicist would tell you that in order for anything to be created, you have to have time, you have to have force, you have to have energy, you have to have space, and you have to have matter. Those five things are a part of any kind of creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The beginning, time, God, force, created uh, energy. Heavens, space, earth, matter, all those things are right there. So there are things that can be learned through this story. However, the thing that we need to concentrate on this morning is that the God of the Bible, the Genesis account of creation, I need that slide up. The Genesis account of creation is less about how of creation than the who of, uh, excuse me, it's less about the how of creation than the who of creation. The Genesis account is not about how dirt became dirt. It's about who made dirt. You know, when we say the words God created, what are we talking about? Well, we're, we're talking about uh, someone who made something out of nothing. That's the story. But I want you to think of it in a different way this morning. I want you to think of it like a painter creating a painting. You know, a painter will, will put the paint to canvas, they'll, they'll create this work of art, and will say that this is their newest creation. Well, did they make the canvas? Did they make the paint? Ordinarily, no. It was an artist working toward an end goal. This story is not about how dirt became dirt. It's not about how stars became stars. It's not about how water became water. It's about who made dirt, stars, and water. It's about the who. It's about the creation, the creating God. So, in order to really understand this, let's open our Bibles to the very first page. No, not the title page. Genesis chapter 1. We're going to read the first 25 verses of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning one day. Then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below and the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse, and it was so. God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening and there was morning a second day. 
Then God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth. And the gathering of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit after their kind with seed in them. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind. And God saw that it was good. There was evening. There was morning a third day. Then God said, let there be light in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to govern the day, the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth and to govern the day and the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. There was evening, there was morning, a fourth day. Then God said, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves with which the water swarmed after their kind and every winged bird after its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply. And fill the waters in the sea and let the birds multiply on earth. There was evening and there was morning, a fifth day. Then God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after their kind. And it was so. God made the beasts of the earth after their kind and the cattle after their kind and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind. And God saw that it was good. You see, this story is not intended to be an explanation about how creation worked. It was supposed to be a reminder of who created us, what were his intentions, and how does he feel about those he's created. As you'll notice, we didn't read the part where he created man, but you'll find in this scripture that repeatedly he backs up and he says that it's good. I think the first thing that this story as it's being handed down over the generations was intended to do is it was intended to remind us of the goodness of God and that that goodness was injected into his creation the goodness of God's creation gives us permission to enjoy his creation and subsequently enjoy our lives six times in this initial scripture six times it says it was good now, when he says that it was good, it's not like he was discovering that it was good. It's not like God created something and he backed up and said, huh, that, that worked out okay. And it wasn't like he was admiring that it was good. After he created men and, or he created uh, the, the people and the, uh, the things in the sea or he created the trees, he didn't back away and say, wow, aren't I cool? Isn't that beautiful? You see, this story is not about him discovering that it was good. It wasn't about him admiring that it was good. When God says things are good, what it is is what's called a benediction. It's a declaration that what he has done within itself, encased in itself, there is goodness. And because of this goodness, we're taught that we can enjoy the things that are around us, and not only that, we can enjoy our lives. That God created goodness. Interesting part of this is, is that as we enjoy our lives, we need to understand that there are parts of life that are very, very important. That if we're really going to enjoy the creation that God has given us, that has to include things like gladness, Laughter, joy, and play. All of those things are good. And, and within a godly context, God intends, intends for his people, his followers, his family to enjoy laughter, play, joy. You know, when I was growing up, I, I grew up in a church that uh, 
Well, I get, let's just say they didn't believe that. Okay, in order to be a good Christian, you had to be serious. I mean, really, really serious. And, and you, had to, you had to be almost dour in your appearance. I used to say, uh, and still do, that you know, these people were, were people who were raised on dill pickles and kept in a freezer their whole life. They were just, they were just cranky. And, then, and, and you know what? It is a misnomer to say that you're a cranky Christian because if you're a Christian, you have so much to be joyous about. You have so much to celebrate. What God created was good, and it reminds us that it's good, and it's to be enjoyed, and that we are to have a life that's full of joy, laughter, play. Second thing this reminds us of is it reminds us that this story has the limitations of God's creation. In this story, there's limitations of the creation. The Genesis account of creation differs from all others in that it includes only one deity. If you take every other account of creation, you're going to find that there's multiple deities in all of these accounts of creation. Often, creation itself, the, the world around us, is to be worshipped. Sometimes men are to be worshipped. However, in this story, there is only one creator, there is only one deity, and there is only one that is deserving of any kind of worship. It's kind of interesting. We live in a culture that would be very quick to say that, yeah, we are to truly enjoy the world around us. However, this same culture worships the creation around them. And they support that, huh? Well, the culture we live in worships money. They place it above God. The culture we live in worships success. The culture we live in worships creation. You don't believe me? How many people would rather go to the lake than go to church? How many people will skip church to go on a hike? And they'll say that I feel God, I experience God in creation. The truth is we experience God through worship and we see him in creation. We enjoy him because of creation. And we have to be very careful because in this world, Christianity is established to enjoy creation. Enjoying creation is great, but worshiping creation is something totally different. You see, there's two extremes to that. There, there are, are a group of people who... Um, are disdained. They, they hate creation, the Gnostics. They believe that all things created are bad and that only when we change in this new body will anything be good. Oh, we don't believe that. And, and then there's another group that says all of things around us are good and we should worship and enjoy creation, but worship it too. That's paganism. But Christianity are people that simply look at creation, see the goodness of God in creation, and know that they can enjoy creation, but there is only one God, and only one God to be worshipped. This story also, uh, well, before we get into that point, when I was in college, I, I dated a girl who, um, let's just say she was a nerd. Anybody ever dated a nerd? I highly recommend it. We would go to the ball games and she would cheer, that's all right, that's okay, you're going to work for me someday. Right, she's one of those. But she really loved The Hobbit. And I got so tired of hearing about Bilbo Baggins when we were dating. It was just, it was horrible because I was constantly hearing about Tolkien and his work and, and Bilbo Baggins. And she forced me to read The Hobbit. I've actually read The Hobbit. Yes, I'm a nerd too. But there's one passage out of the book, The Hobbit, that I want to read to you when it comes to enjoying nature, the things around it. It's talking about the hobbits, and it says, They had mouths apt to laughter, eating and drinking, and laugh they did, and eat and drink they did, often heartily, six meals a day if they could get it. Nonetheless, ease and peace had left them tough as an old tree root. They were unwearyingly fond of good things, not the least because they could, when put to it, do without them. You see, we should enjoy the world around us, but it shouldn't be the basis of our happiness. God it's what we worship. He is the basis of our happiness. 
There's only one deity in this story. Next, it reminds us how much God values his creation. God values his creation so highly that he became creation. He was incarnated. He became man in order to redeem and to restore that which he created. He values what he created, including you, so much that he became one of us. You know, told in John that the Word became flesh and dwelled among us. We're told in, in 2 Corinthians that he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might be the righteousness of God in him. And what it's saying is saying God became one of us so that he could save us from being us. He values us so much that he would rather die than live without us. Right, the God who was there in the beginning, that, that when they said, let us make man in our image, that he was part of the us and he was part of the hour. The one who, who put all the stars into space, the one that formed the dirt and the dry land and put the water here and created everything that you know and everything that you see, he valued us, you, so much that he'd become like you in all things. So they could be a faithful high priest. And he went to a cross. He died. He was put in a grave. He was brought back to walk this earth to let you know that someday you'll be raised from the dead too. He values us so much that he became creation in order to restore and to redeem creation. It's kind of interesting within all of us we look at the world around us, the creation, and sometimes we see bad. We see sickness. We see injustice. We see poverty. And our first reaction is to say, God, if you're really God, how can you let this happen? We dig in Scripture and we see his revelation to us and it tells us that these things happen because sin and, 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 and bad things are in the world. God created good and we made it bad. But you know, how about this? When we start thinking that what God created is good, that he is the only God there is, and that he was willing to become like us in order to restore and redeem, that when we see sickness, when we see social injustice, when we see poverty, instead of blaming God, we should be quick to rush to his side and say, this is what you came to restore. This is what you came to make right. Let us help you. Let us be with you as you redeem and restore the things that are around us. In John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, we read these words that are probably very familiar to you. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. You see, God didn't send his Son here to judge the world. He'll do that later. Jesus was sent to take on the form of mankind this big God who does big things and tells it in a big way, he came to become like us because he didn't want to judge the world, but so that he could save it. I'll read, think of that again. He didn't come to judge it. He didn't come to make it worse. He came to make it better. He didn't come so that we would feel worse about ourselves. He came so that we could be better. You know, earlier I mentioned benediction. And really, that's what this entire story is about. This entire story of the creation in Genesis 1 is a story that was handed down time after time after time to tell us that there was a God and he created all that we know and that within this story, he keeps saying that it is good. That it is good that it was good, and he creates man, and he says something a little different. He says, it was very good. That's how much he loves you. That's what he thinks of you. 
And if you read Scripture, you'll find that after the benediction of Genesis chapter 1, there are no more benedictions until you get to a different story. There's another story. It's a story of how his son had become man. It's a story about how he went by the waters. He speaks to John the Baptist. He asks to be baptized. John baptizes him. And then something amazing happens in Luke chapter 3, verses 22. Actually, I'm going to read 21 verses. Now when all the people were baptized, Jesus was also baptized. And while he was praying, heaven was open. And here's verse 22. And the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came out of heaven. Look at what God says. You, you are my beloved son. In you, I am well pleased. He looks at his son and he says, you're good. You know, we all, we all desire benediction. We all desire some kind of validation, someone to tell us or something to tell us that we are good. Sometimes we look for it in a parent. If you're a father and you have a son, I want to encourage you at some point while you're trying to launch them on society, at some point while you're trying to prepare them to be a, a great human being, a good citizen, and more importantly, a good Christian, at some point you need to tell your son you're good. You need to tell your daughters you're good because they yearn to hear it. And maybe it's not parents. Maybe you grew up in a home where you were told you were good, but maybe it's your boss. You work hard, you keep your nose to the grindstone because what you want is that validation to say, you're good. Or maybe it's a spouse. You want your spouse to tell you how important you are in their life and that you're a priority for them and that you, in their eyes, are good. But I can tell you that all of these validations, all of these benedictions, None of them will fill that hole in your heart that you want to hear the one who created it all say to you, you're my beloved child. In you, I'm well pleased. You see, the creating God yearns to say what we yearn to hear. And that's that we are good. And this only occurs through Jesus. It's only when we become part of Jesus, we're in Christ, we're baptized into Christ, but we become in Christ that God will look at us and he'll say, you're good. Someday. The God who was the creator, the creating God, the God that gave benediction saying that creation is good and looked at you and said, this creation is good. Someday everything that you know will be gone. The world around us will go away in a fire. It'll happen like that. It'll take me longer to tell you about it than it will for it to happen. And we'll be standing face to face in front of God. And those of us who are in Christ are going to hear this. Well done, good, and faithful servant. You're good. Enter into my rest. You see, it's my prayer that we experience as a group and as individuals this benediction where God looks at us and says, You're good. Because of my son, because of what he's done, and because of your faith, you're good. Let's pray. God, we love you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for all blessings in life. And that's our prayer that you pronounce us good, just like you did creation. You're the creating God. You're the only one worthy of worship. And you're the one that has done everything around us and has done everything in us. And our prayer is that you see this and you declare it to be good. We thank you for your son, Jesus, because it's only in him that we are good. 
we worship and praise his name this morning. Father, it's our prayer that uh, lives will be changed and people will be touched by knowing that you yearn to say that we're good because we yearn to hear it. In Jesus we pray. Amen.